Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and we have a segment lined up for you today that we've been looking forward to for a long time, as have many of you. And that is the latest cinematic interpretation based on the classic novel by Eric Maria Remarque entitled All Quiet on the Western Front. This is a classic anti-war tale about the disillusionment of youth amidst wartime, and I'm really looking forward to delving into some of the complexities and cinematic traits and variations that we might be able to find within this movie. I'm watching this on the premiere date of the film on Netflix, and so this will be my genuine first time reaction in watching the film, but as always, I will be offering some historical commentary along the way. If you would like a fuller, in-depth breakdown of the entire movie, I invite you to become supporters of our channel on Patreon, and you can see this film more in-depth as well as many others. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in to All Quiet on the Western Front. Wow. <laughs> that was a hell of an opening. <laughs> So right off the bat, there's a few takeaways here. I think something that is very evocative is this idea that the men who are wearing uniforms are more disposable than the uniforms that are on their back. And this certainly speaks to that idea of the senseless violence that we often associate with the First World War. The film actually begins in 1917, not 1914 or 1915. Uh, in the book, the main protagonist of Paul goes to the front lines in 1915. So we have a two-year variation, a difference between the book and the film. And that's something interesting to start off with. The future of Deutschland lies in the hands of its greatest generation. My friends, that is you, you see! The schoolmaster that we see here is undoubtedly the character of Kantorak, uh, who weighs very heavily in both the book and the original 1930 film adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front. Although, I, I sense all, almost immediately here that perhaps this is his only scene in the film. I'll be interested to see if his character returns, uh, because he, like I said, plays a very important part in subsequent chapters of the novel. I remember it, you were. <laughs> oh, Ludwig, will you be snatching away all the ladies from us now? <laughs> yeah. And that guy with the glasses is gonna die. Those glasses are gonna be a cinematic device later on, I suspect. Each other. Your vol, sir. Your vol, sir. Your vol, sir. Welcome to the 78th Reserve Infantry Regiment. We are now on the Western Front. So I believe the military outfit that they are referencing is the 78th Reserve Division. And this was one of several sort of composite divisions that was created at the outset of the war in 1914 and remained in the thick of the fighting throughout. Uh, one of these divisions might consist of anywhere between 12 and 14,000 men, uh, depending upon its actions and what sort of combat it was witnessing. Paul Barmer, you will almost certainly be dead by dawn. Tension! Gas mask off! Gas mask off! Gas masks, of course, were ubiquitous for fighting on the Western Front. Uh, these sorts of gas masks were sometimes referred to as gum gas masks because they had elastic bands that could go around a soldier's head. Uh, and that sort of time that they were able to spare in putting them on in case of a gas attack was a much welcomed amenity. Throw a dog a piece of meat, that will always snap it up. Give a man power, man is a beast. So here we are introduced to the character of Cat as he becomes known amongst uh, the other characters in the book. And he very much becomes a guiding force for young Paul throughout the story. This is a great representation of trench life, and th here's a factor that we don't often see in Hollywood representations of the conflict, and that's the fact that these trenches flooded all the time. Yes, there are 
you know, muddy and flooded crater holes out in no man's land. But the, the physical act of bailing out water out of a trench uh, is something I can't ever recall seeing in a depiction of trench warfare in film. So well done. In these sorts of conditions, of course, soldiers were prone to getting trench foot, and this was a bacterial infection of sorts that was often caused by your inability to keep your feet dry. And as a result, your skin would essentially slip right off your feet and your skin would become discolored, blackened, and it was just a, a horrid uh, supplemental misery to coincide with all of these other detriments. For as frightening as it is, there's this strange sort of mystical aura to no man's land at night, uh, especially with all of the flares going off. Now, veterans of World War I, after they had been in the trenches for a prolonged period of time, if you found yourself out in the middle of no man's land as a flare was coming down, you were best served to remain completely still rather than trying to duck down and take cover uh, amidst all of the debris of the battlefield because it's not that the enemy can see you yourself it's that they can see your movement in reaction to that flare going up and so chances are if you remain completely still you would just merely look like another piece of debris out there amidst all the other debris <laughs> It's a very accurate representation of what this incoming artillery can do to the human body. Go on! Go on! I'd certainly say by this point his enthused, optimistic outlook about this supposedly grand, noble adventure has most definitely dissipated by this point. And in one regard, I'm a little bit disappointed here at the outset of the film because there's very little character development telling us who Paul is, where exactly he's from, what his worldview was that prompted him to join the army in the first place. Uh, it, this is lacking that sort of foundational element that we see in both the book and in previous iterations of the story. But we'll see how the story progresses from here on. Are you injured? No. Then start gathering. The German dog tags are very distinctive because, as we can see in this scene right here, they are able to snap them in half that allows the disc to be collected and they can be passed on to a superior, yet the other half of the disc retaining the same information remains on the corpse when they are later to be recovered. Mm, and my prediction was correct that those glasses <laughs> indeed become a cinematic device, a, a tangible, item attesting to the loss. I find elements of the soundtrack to be very Wagner-like, which I think is very appropriate for the tone of the film. Once more, over 40,000 killed in the last few weeks alone. That should convince the general staff. I think the gentlemen know it's over. We all know that. So here we see another drastic point of departure from the book because it would seem that the film is getting us into the political and strategic realm rather than the view of the common soldaten, so to speak. The character that we were just introduced to, played by actor Daniel Brohl, who may very well may be the, the best known actor in this film, he plays Matthias Ersberger. And Ersberger was a member of the Center Catholic Party, which was one of the prevailing political bodies in the Reich at this time and still is in operation to this very day. And he increasingly becomes a symbol of Germany's quest to end the war. He had long been hesitant, perhaps even we could say a critic uh, of the war 
from the outset, and he is going to be a fundamental figure in the negotiation process once we get into the fall of 1918. But his character, he's a real life person, he is not in the book. And I'm wondering at this point if it's wise to get into the bigger picture of the war, if it will detract from the experience of the common soldier, which is what the book is. So we shall see. My God, there's stunning cinematography in all this. And I, that gets us to another interesting point. Uh, the, the film director, Francois Truffaut, once said that there's no such thing as an anti-war film because so many of what are considered the best war films, they are so beautifully shot and mounted and orchestrated. And additionally, some of them are downright thrilling and exciting. So how do you balance all of that out? Can there anything be truly an anti-war film? Uh, and I, I think that a film like this begs that sort of question. What is he doing? I don't know if Franz is deserting or just going out for some uh, recreational activity, but in any case, desertion became a major problem for the German army by the time we get to 1918. Um, in a lot of the rear areas, uh, there were deserters who were just kind of wandering and milling about, uh, perhaps ingratiating themselves with the regional French population. Uh, many of the battalions were at half strength by 1918, uh, so it's, it's not any stretch that a soldier might just throw down his uniform and go start mingling with the locals quite freely. This is often how latrines were set up, and in fact, there's a, a number of photos that exist that uh, attest to this as well. Uh, there was really no sense of privacy in the army, shall we say. That's all I have to tell you this time. Sending kisses from your wife for you, Peter Zane. It's a beautiful scene that underscores the importance of the written word and correspondence in wartime, and this most definitely is a lost art form. Uh, but it was the only means of communication. It was the only way to have a sense of what was going on at home, or if you have a loved one away in the service, of what possibly they were enduring on the front lines. And uh, so many of thousands of these letters are now available in digital repositories, and they're incredible primary sources, ones that I tried to to use in the classroom because it brings out a certain level of humanity that your your typical perhaps military document doesn't quite evoke. I suspect the general that we just saw in the car was Quartermaster General Eric Ludendorff, who weighs quite largely in the fighting of the war, especially in its final year and throughout the negotiation process. I'll be interested to see what sort of role his character will play in this plot. No, oh, they've only been missing since yesterday. He's been hanging there for some time. How many are we looking for? 60 young recruits. Oof. Uh, as such a, a sight was not uncommon in this sort of environment, uh, a body part scattered everywhere, hanging in trees. It's a, a, a dark but good detail that we see depicted here. <sighs> Stupid boys, they took their masks off too soon. One can only imagine the, the horror and the burning sensation that people endured in their final moments under such circumstances. I have just put the German delegation to the armistice negotiations on the train to Compiègne. These people, Brixdorf, are selling out our fatherland. By September of 1918, it was becoming apparent to many members of the German high command that they were engaged in a struggle of futility. And what General Ludendorff wished to do was to kind of skirt the British and the French because he believed that he might be able to get better terms at the negotiation table uh, via the United States. Uh, but uh, in the interim, it was full speed ahead in regard to the fighting. If the fighting is ferocious enough, perhaps he can settle for better terms in the long run. The Social Democrats will be the end of mankind, Brixdorf. 
but his character gets at something in this headquarters scene that becomes very important in the considerations and understandings of post-war Germany, where it was people like Ludendorff who said that it was the, the leftists within his own country that had stabbed the military in the back. And after the war, this creates much resentment uh, against uh, the left-wing politicians and political class. And it's that sort of resentment, which of course will give rise to Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. Uh, and so the rhetoric matters, uh, and we can see some of that being incorporated here in the film by General Ludendorff. My orders are war. And all the while that is the case, I shall fight for every meter. One of the important things to remember though, uh, if somebody is to blame for Germany's defeat, it is General Ludendorff himself. Uh, so this is, this is quite fascinating that we see this being uh, depicted here in the film. Uh, we, we have just these brief glances of negotiation happening in these far off places. Uh, they're being carried out by diplomats and politicians who are in well-dressed suits. They have full breakfasts. Meanwhile, their soldiers are living here in the muck. In God's name, don't let 72 hours pass us by here. Thousands of lives depend on it. So we just saw a, a recreation of Marshal Ferdinand Foch of the French army. And uh, in preparation for this film, I got out a, a, an old book from my undergraduate days called uh, The Mammoth Book of Eyewitness World War I. And uh, Foch had something to say about this moment in his rail car uh, in here in northern France. And he said, at the moment when negotiations for the signing of an armistice are just being opened, it is impossible to stop military operations until the German delegation has accepted and signed the conditions, which are the very consequence of those operations. As for the situation described by Herr Erzberger as existing among the German troops and the danger he fears of Bolshevism spreading in Germany, the one is the unusual disease prevailing the beaten armies. The other is symptomatic of a nation completely worn out by war. Western Europe will find means of defending itself against the danger. And so here is some of Foch's view on this ongoing negotiation process as men continue to die on the field. <laughs> This is a good depiction of showing how a trench in an enemy position is swept out. Uh, very up close, personal, hand to hand combat. And then once you have annihilated the enemy, you get to partake in some war trophies, whether it be personal items or food that they have here in a commissary area. Oh, wow. What a great detail. The rats scurrying across the floor. Uh, soldiers made killing rats almost a, a sport. Uh, and here, too, there are photos of them killing them and hanging them up along strings, you know, almost like they're trophies in and of themselves. Rats were everywhere. They had plenty of rotted flesh to feed off of for years and years on end. There's a great shot of, of the French tank coming up over its trench line with the smoke of mustard gas coming up behind it. Uh, what we see depicted here are Saint-Germain tanks. These are French armored vehicles, uh, an early uh, version uh, of the tank. And of course, uh, it, tanks were devised during this time to sweep out these sort of trenches. And those look like modern treads on a tank. <laughs> those are not World War I treads. Uh, small grievance. But uh, here too, this is a little bit different from the book. There are no tanks uh, in the book. Uh, and so this is 
some art artistic license, not necessarily a historical license, but it shows how the war is evolving. Uh, we often think of uh, World War I as this just sort of uh, senseless stalemate in which uh, both sides refused to budge or change the manner in which they fought. Uh, but both sides were furiously adopting and embracing and devising new forms of technology and transportation to give them the upper edge on the battlefield. And armored vehicles like this certainly fit within that category. Oh, oh. And this is exactly what tanks were designed to do. Uh, that they would be able to just crawl like these deadly caterpillars climbing over these various trench lines. The heavy machine guns jutting out the sides of them could sweep the trenches. Uh, but one thing w with the trenches though here, um, in real life they may have been a little bit more zigzag than what we see depicted here because that zigzag pattern would prevent that sort of sweeping fire from sweeping down an entire trench line. So, yeah. So as we mentioned in the breakdown for the trailer of this film that can also be found on our channel, uh, flamethrowers are, are of course uh, and other weapon that is being incorporated here on a mass scale. Uh, typically you would have an operator, he would have a small contingent of infantrymen who acted as support because flamethrower operators were marked men. Uh, they were among the most targeted of individuals by the enemy. Uh, however, I can't recall any accounts where there were like a dozen or 20 all clustered together here in a given moment, such as we see here. This, this too may be a little bit of artistic embellishment just to create even a more apocalyptic scene than what it already was. Well, and here we have our Captain Miller moment, or this uh, mental phase out that we see in so many war films over the past 25 years. Oh boy, <laughs> drinking the water used to cool the machine gun, damn. I miss my comrades, sir. I miss them all. I miss my mother for God's sake. Grenades, ammunition, come on. This is a good representation of the, of the take and go nature of, of trench warfare. The lines are very, very fluid here. You are aware this is a total capitulation. 250,000 Americans are landing each month in Europe. Erzberger just mentioned one of the the, the main reasons why uh, Germany is so concerned here, uh, and that's because after these, these years of prolonged warfare, there's this sudden influx of American manpower and material, and indeed the French and the British had been campaigning for America entry into the war for many years by this point, and this was one of the, the key contributing factors that pushes the Allies over the edge. What a powerful scene. This is one of the most compelling parts of, of the book, which have likewise been depicted in the earlier film versions of this story. Uh, there's a more flowery version of this that happens in, in the 1930 version. But ultimately, what it shows us is that it's a lot harder to kill somebody emotionally when you see them face to face, when you see the, the human cost that it inflicts not only on them but their family members. It's a lot easier to shoot at a distant silhouette uh, that dehumanizes the process of killing a little bit. Uh, it's an entirely different matter when you stab them. Uh, up close and personal as such. So on the front page of the newspaper we just saw, we just learned about the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II. This occurred on November 9th, 1918, and it was a sure indicator 
that everything was about to fall apart and things grew all the more desperate as a result. The Kaiser ultimately flees to the Netherlands and there he passes away in 1941 as World War II is intensifying. Mm. There's a butterfly on the handkerchief, which uh, plays so prominently in the book. I have soup here for you. Oh, you brought cutlery? Yes, we brought cutlery as well. <gasps> oh. oh, oh my god. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Who made you do that? Why would you? Sadly, this was not an entirely uncommon thing for men who were horribly wounded and felt like if they were to return home and couldn't function as whole men that there was really no reason for them to live. Uh, and that, that was the, the sad sort of mentality that was drilled into people with this 19th century attitude that was still lingering about uh, manhood and being able to conduct life accordingly. Uh, so incredibly horrific, tragic thing. And come to think of it, the character of Todden was a locksmith, uh, and he actually survives. And so uh, here is uh, another fairly substantial difference. There are elements of these night scenes with definite 1917 vibes. I think, too, without the success of 1917, that this film probably would not have been made. But the success of that movie demonstrated that audiences were, in fact, interested in this time period. And if the story is told well, uh, it can offer something very compelling. I think something else in the realm of popular culture, the video game Battlefield 1, of course, uh, invigorated a whole lot of enthusiasm and interest in the First World War. So, despite its flaws, whatever they may be, uh, give credit where credit is due. Population, through no fault of its own, faces hunger and anarchy is setting in. Indeed, there was a lot of internal strife within Germany at this time. It was at the, the edge of revolution. There were an increasing number of people with Soviet sentiments in Germany. A number of uh, cities had the red flag flying above them at this given time. Uh, so the, the peril was immense. Let the minutes record. The armistice here signed shall take effect in six hours from now. The armistice of Compiègne was signed at 5.45 in the morning, but as was just said, the fighting would continue until the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Uh, and so there's just this sort of madness to all of this because people knew that the fighting was going to cease, yet the bloodshed continued. And it's estimated that perhaps upward of 3,000 people died in a matter of those hours. Incredibly tragic stuff. Très bien. La guerre est finie. The, the railway car in which the armistice is signed is of course the same railway car that will be used in 1940 when France capitulates to Nazi Germany. And that was a, a sticking point that Adolf Hitler insisted upon that that surrender process take place in the same railway car where Germany had been humiliated in November of 1918. We are about to attack them with the utmost force and vehemence. We will seize the planes before 11 a.m. and end this war with a merciless strike. I'm not sure whether the general standing in the balcony here is supposed to be Ludendorff. I didn't pick up on any formal introduction to his character. He might be a composite character of Ludendorff and Hindenburg or just kind of this, you know, pompous sort of uh, German officer characterization. Uh, but if it is Ludendorff, Ludendorff was kind of out of the picture to an extent. He had to resign his position. He was essentially dismissed by the emperor in early November uh, 1918. And so if that is indeed him, um, in the historical reality, he wouldn't have necessarily been in a position as such as we saw here. <laughs> the, 
the scene is very reminiscent of a battle account by a German soldier in 1916 by the name of Friedrich Steinbrecher. And he said, we advanced through the shattered woods in a hell of shells. I don't know how I found the right way. Then across an expanse of shell craters and on and on, falling down and getting up again. Machine guns were firing. I had to cut across our own barrage and the enemies. I am untouched. As we reach the front line, Frenchmen are forcing their way in. The tide of the battle ebbs and flows. Then things get quieter. We have not fallen back a foot. Now one's eye begins to see things. I want to keep running on, to stand still, and the look is horrible. A wall of dead and wounded. How often I have read the phrase. Now I know what it means. Steinbrecher was killed in combat less than a year later. The level of rage, the level of adrenaline that consumes somebody in a moment like this. I've read so many accounts where people are just, it's like they've been taken off a leash. They're absolutely unrestrained by what they're seeing and, and what they're doing. Uh, and then the emotional weight of that catches up with them. Uh, as we saw in the previous scene where Paul stabs the Frenchman in the crater. On the point of material culture in this film, the German uniforms are quite good. The French uniforms, eh, they could be a little bit better. And now the shoe is on the other foot. There's so many stories like this of men killed in the last moments of the war, the last seconds of the war at 10.58, at 10.59. Uh, just the madness of, of the hour. It, it's almost inconceivable. And it's German officers as such who feed the big lie at war's end and beyond about being stabbed in the back at home by politicians and whatnot. And in the long run, all it does is lead to another world war. Uh, Erzberger himself, he's assassinated in 1921, uh, perhaps in regard to some of his fiscal policies, but certainly him being characterized as the person who sold Germany out in the minds of some uh, certainly didn't help his cause at all in the post-war years. And the story ends in many ways the same way that it begins. Butterfly, and here we see the, the butterfly on the scarf that he is in essence, bequeathing to the young soldier who discovers him in the trench. Hmm. I don't know what to think. Hmm. So here at the end of the film, I'm, I'm a bit emotionally torn on how I feel about it. As the storyline progressed, uh, I didn't think that the, the political subplot was too much of a distraction, although I think it possibly could have been a stronger film had it by and large remained with Paul exclusively throughout the narrative. Uh, and it lost on some opportunities to dwell on some of the same themes that that subplot did. If I think back to the book, uh, there are some very telling moments where Paul uh, goes home on furlough. He confronts Kantorik, his old teacher, who essentially brainwashed him into thinking that this war was just going to be a, a grand, noble adventure. He warns all of the other fellow students. Uh, it's an incredibly powerful scene, both in book and in film. And I, I'm left wondering... 
uh, did this movie miss the mark by not incorporating scenes like that and instead uh, taking us to these real life characters and away from the, the human element that really make uh, the novel a, a masterpiece. So I'm, I'm very torn on all of that as I sit here re reflecting on this modern version of All Quiet on the Western Front. One area in which I think the movie excels is the, the gritty, violent, rather monotonous nature of trench warfare that is uh, depicted. Uh, I, I could think of a number of clips uh, from this film that would be very fitting to show in the classroom along those lines. Uh, I think uh, the, the young actor who played Paul uh, did a very good job. I think that was the, the great strength of the film. I think uh, he is the, the youthful embodiment uh, that the character of, of Paul was. And uh, the, the amount of emotion that he was able to convey uh, with, with uh, just his, his facial reaction uh, to a lot of the situations that he found himself in, uh, I think earns him a, a lot of praise. Uh, I, I think he did a very, very fine job in this regard. Uh, given how, how different the movie is from the book, I mean, if you're looking for a, a fully faithful adaptation um, of the book, you aren't going to find it here. Uh, but I, I find it interesting from an artistic standpoint uh, that Paul is stabbed in the back because after all, that's how many Germans felt uh, after the war. And so perhaps there's a little bit of symbolism to be found in that regard. I don't think from an emotional level, this one meets the 1930 original. Uh, I think that one is in a league of its own. This one though, of course, it has a greater degree of authenticity because it is actually in German. Uh, this is the first cinematic representation of All Quiet on the Western Front that is in the language that it is supposed to be in. So it was nice to have that element of it. I still think the 1931 is a superior bit of storytelling because the storyline is more coherent and it stays with the main characters. Um, I'm also not as emotionally drawn in as 1917. I think this film is a more effective anti-war film. I think 1917 is a better piece of filmmaking. And those are some of the, the, the key thoughts that I am left with here as we start to wrap things up. Before I leave you, I always try to offer a few book recommendations as well. And uh, one that I used as an undergraduate and was able to uh, get a good sense of life on the Western Front was through some of the excerpts in this book. It is called The Mammoth Book of Eyewitness, World War I. And it is full of hundreds of incredible firsthand accounts uh, stretching from Germany to Damascus. Uh, it covers all of the theaters of the war and offers a truly global perspective for this global war. If you are a beginner in regard to World War I history and you're interested in learning a little bit more, a really fine primer is this book uh, published by the Smithsonian Institution, which is likewise a very good global history of the war. It is an excellent coffee table book. It is full of all sorts of great graphs and maps, uh, illustrations, photos, paintings, and what have you. If you are a visual learner, uh, this book very well may be up your alley and well suited to you. If you are a new viewer here to our channel, the best thing that you can do to help us out is to hit that subscribe button below. We'd also be interested in hearing your thoughts on All Quiet on the Western Front, as well as other questions or suggestions that you may have for us. As I said at the outset of our video, you can also support us on Patreon. You can get all sorts of additional benefits there. We have a splendid t-shirt store where you can get all sorts of fine historical swag. And we also have a very useful website full of educational resources. You can find that at realhistoryfilms.com. And of course, last but not least, uh, we would be remiss if we did not recommend the book all Quiet on the Western Front itself. Uh, it is one of the great literary classics. 
Uh, this copy is one of the first editions that was sold here in the United States. This is a 1930 edition. It was released right after, a year or so after the original form. It came out in Germany. And I could think of no better way to conclude our episode than sharing a small excerpt of the book that I think gets to the heart of its themes and also the heart of the story. In the final pages of the book, Remark writes, And men will not understand us, for the generation that grew up before us, though it has passed these years with us here, already had a home and a calling. Now it will return to its old occupations, and the war will be forgotten. And the generation that has grown up after us will be strange to us and push us aside. We will be superfluous even to ourselves. We will grow older. A few will adapt themselves. Some others will merely submit, and most will be bewildered. The years will pass by, and in the end we shall fall into ruin. And I think the great task remaining before us now, as the world confronts similar challenges on a global scale, uh, is not to forget stories like All Quiet on the Western Front because its themes are universal. It tells us about humanity. It tells us about young life that is wasted in war. And that is why it remains one of the great cautionary tales of the modern age. Food for thought until you join us next time on Real History. We'll see you then.